thanks a lot. Thanks to the Cal team for inviting me. Um, and thank you all for giving up your morning uh, to come and listen to me. Um, so my talk today is, as you can see on screen, is about innovation um, and the politics of command. Um, and I'm going to be expanding that out to talk not just about command, but also leadership as well. So innovation in and of itself is kind of uh, a word we hear a lot. It's big business. Um, it's a term that's bandied around a number of sectors, not just defense, but we hear it in, in the business world in particular. And the thing with innovation is that it's seen as a bit of a silver bullet, um, that it's uh, a way of increasing competitive advantage. And it's very much become, I think, the watchword for increasingly lean forces. Things like entrepreneurialism, transformation, are all the kind of buzzwords that have become um, I think quite important to forces as they're working in quite financially constrained times. Um, and the messaging from the top is um, very clear, it makes that desire very clear. In his 2018 Rusi lecture, for example, CDS, as you can see on screen, spoke about the need to transform in order to become the agile and adaptive organisation that the future demands. His predecessor, Stuart Peach, spoke on a very similar theme in 2017, so talking about innovation not being a process or a slogan, but how defence responds to the new threat environment. And this drive for innovation, I think, is also underpinned by the Defence um, Innovation Initiative published in 2016, which really kind of codifies this drive and speaks of a culture that is innovative by instinct, a culture that requires the acceptance, the taking of risk responsibly across the defence enterprise. Now, I think these aspirations in and of themselves are, are incredibly laudable, but just how good are militaries at doing innovation? And if we look back historically, and I suppose even in, in the public mindset, is that innovation is, doesn't come particularly naturally to the armed forces, that actually militaries aren't that good at it. Um, writing as early as 1839, you have a colonel in the British Army, John Mitchell, saying that in no profession is the dread of innovation so great as in the army. We can take from that what we will. But I think what Mitchell's remarks speak to here is that kind of trope of inflexibility, mental inflexibility, and organisational inflexibility. Writing almost 100 years after Mitchell, Basil Little Hart, who I'm sure we all know and love, warned how the progress of weapons has outstripped the progress of the mind, especially in that class who wield weapons. And each successive war of modern time has revealed the lag due to the slow pace of mental adaptation. Organisationally, previous Prime Ministers have castigated the British Army. The Prime Minister in the First World War said that the Army's methods were rigid, that they were restrictive, that they didn't allow for any play of inventiveness, imagination or initiative. And I think in many respects these tropes are all underpinned by this idea that the army in particular requires outsiders to come in and do that innovation for them, whether that's scientists, civilian experts, ministers, and I think we can see it today with the appetite for management consultants, people coming in and telling the army how to do things. And this has been picked up by people serving in the military. Um, US General Ben Hodges, for example, spoke in 2017 at the Rusi Land Warfare Conference saying that changing an organisation is like moving a graveyard. The people there aren't much help. So this need to kind of bring people in to make change happen. Now, of course, I think there's probably an element of truth to a lot of these tropes. But I think they really obscure the reality that, A, the army has historically, and I think remains, a key site for innovation that's largely homegrown in nature. And B, that it's its command and leadership at all levels of the army that continues to play a vital empowering and enabling role where innovation is concerned. Now, that latter point is, is absolutely nothing new. You've got esteemed scholars such as Stephen Rosen writing about how senior leaders in particular are really important to generating innovation, that they create these kind of promotion pathways to protect innovators. Now, I think we should kind of go beyond that, go further than that, and I put to you that we need to see leaders and treat leaders as our innovators-in-chief, irrespective of whether they're at platine level or CGS, that we 
all have a, a part to play here. And that it goes beyond those promotion pathways for a select few, that actually it's an organisational undertaking. And that's kind of what I want to explore in my paper this morning. So the role, the responsibility that commanders and leaders have to play in that innovation process. And I want to use examples here from the historic and the contemporary British Army. So why am I using history? Because um, I'm a military historian and that's what I do, so I thought I would share that with you. But also history is really important. Um, an interwar report written in 1924 on education in the army says that it's always helpful for practitioners to have a background for their reasoning which, which, against which they can set or estimate it. And the, uh, the French historian, Marc Bloch, said that by examining how and why yesterday differed from the day before, history can reach conclusions which will enable it to see how tomorrow will differ from yesterday. So that's my kind of soapbox as to why I think history is important here. What I want to do in this paper is kind of put forward to you three key arguments, as you can see on screen, is that first, contrary to a lot of those anti-innovation tropes that we're all familiar with, that actually complex hierarchical organisations like the army are constantly trying to find ways of doing things differently, encouraging different ways of thinking. And a number of these ways are not necessarily just internal to the army, they're also external as well. Secondly, as mentioned previously, that leaders, again, at all levels, are fundamental to empowering and enabling divergent and creative thinking, which can then lead to innovation. And finally, and I think it'll be interesting to perhaps tease this out in the discussion, is that from my look at this, that the ways and methods that leaders use to encourage innovation um, are often related to the flattening or the intelligent subversion of uh, the chain of command itself. Now you can see at the bottom there the kind of structure I want to cover off. Um, first, with those organisational challenges, I just kind of want to set a context here. Um, the challenges I'm speaking to are very much internal to the army, so I've left off the obvious one of, of budgets and finance. Um, but I want to sort of show you really what the army is up against, what it has to overcome in order to do innovation successfully. Secondly, this idea of a leadership constellation. Now, this is me putting myself out there and kind of road testing um, sort of a view that I've got or a, a process I'm looking at with regards to how um, the process of innovation might work. Now, I want to stress here that I'm not focusing on the output or the capability that emerges at the end of this process. It's very much highlighting to you what I see as the potential avenues and methods by which ideas are generated, captured, and then implemented. And I want to show you kind of how that works in, in practice, really. So three examples there, drawn from the First World War, drawn from uh, Nigel Bagnall's time um, in the Cold War, and then the contemporary army today. And I think that many of you in the room will you know, be able to perhaps challenge me, come back on some of the points that I raise, um, which would be really great, a really good discussion. My talk, um, I'm, not, I'm not here to provide you with the answers, sadly, um, because I don't have them. Um, the talk itself is meant to be provocative. It's meant to kind of really get across to you that innovation is a process, but it's a really complicated one because it's fundamentally a human endeavour. And with that comes that whole plethora of friction, agendas, um, and just human behaviour. So because of this, there isn't a cookie cutter solution um, of how to get innovation right, but perhaps there is a way of getting it right enough, is what I'd suggest. So that's what I'm going to cover in the time I've got left. To look to these challenges first. So I think the army in particular does face a number of ingrained challenges to innovation that are quite distinct from resource and budgetary constraints. And I think what's interesting, or maybe perhaps slightly worrying, depending on, on how sceptical you are, is that many of these challenges are mainstays in a historical sense. So a lot of the challenges that I'll flag up were challenges facing the army before the First World War, in the period before the Second World War, and I'm sure during the wars of decolonization as well. And a number of these challenges I put to you is that they're much harder to overcome when you're in a time of ostensible peace. Actually, in wartime, a lot of these fall away. So there are four in total, three up on the screen there. The first, and 
This seems to be bandied around a lot, that fear of failure accompanied by caginess towards uh, taking risk. Yet CDS talks about the taking of sensible intellectual risk and the need to accept some failure. Now, to me, this throws up a lot of questions. What does some failure mean? How much failure is acceptable and how much is too much? And I think when we understand and when we conceptualize innovation, at its very heart is failure. It's as much about failure as it is about success. It's clumsy and it requires um, actually a lot of quite painful learning before you get the output, the outcome that you want. And it also requires risk taking. That's just the, the fact of it, I'm afraid. I just wonder how willing are personnel to take risk in order to achieve this end result? And to what extent, if there is a reticence to take risk, is this tied into the current SJAR um, and OJAR as well? So put simply, how do you manage failure and risk and see both as a positive learning experience? The second point, again, I'm sure quite familiar to you, this idea of speaking truth to power. Um, and I saw some great examples on the CALS Insights um, on, on their website, which highlight the importance of um, intelligent disobedience, creative conflict, but also collaborative leadership. But I just wonder whether those examples um, are actually the exception rather than the rule. And are we more likely to find some of those examples at the tactical level rather than the operational or the strategic? And if that is the case, then why is that the case? I think what's interesting um, when we think about some of the key findings of the Chilcot report um, is the importance of that reasonable challenge um, and the real kind of seeking out of diversity of thought. Yet, of course, you know, enacting reasonable challenge um, is daunting and it can be quite risky. And I think there still remains there a kind of fear of retribution and the possible impact that might have on career progression. So the third point, um, I think that speaking truth to power very much amplifies or um, kind of underpins that third challenge. And this is this perceived idea of groupthink within the army. Now research, you know, across FTSE 100 companies, et cetera, has, has highlighted the benefits of diversity, not just in terms of gender, ethnicity, and sexuality, but also cognitive diversity. So getting people in who, who think a little bit differently. And I think we've all seen from the new recruitment campaign that there's a real drive there um, to diversify, to encourage that new generation um, of individuals to join the army. We also have this idea of lateral entry, so obviously getting people in from cyber, people who work on AI into the army. But this isn't a panacea, it's not the silver bullet, and that is going to require considerable change, I think, within the army. And again, put simply, the army is a bottom-fed, hierarchical organisation, so is there a degree of inevitability to groupthink and that we just need to be aware of it in order to mitigate rather than necessarily overcome that? And the fourth challenge um, is innovation itself, because this needs to be done quickly. It needs to be done seemingly at all costs. Yet I think we underestimate perhaps how expensive innovation actually is, not just in terms of resource, but in terms of manpower, in terms of time. And I think you know, these shrinking budgets that you know, a number of Western militaries are subject to necessitate efficiencies, you know, working smarter, being more creative. Yeah, I think a number of these goals are perhaps more aspirational than they are deliverable or realizable. And as we saw on an earlier slide, Stuart Peach in 2017 talking about innovation and equipment in terms of months rather than years. Um, this ambition requires time, space, empowerment. And when I talk about space, I'm kind of referring to that white space that is easy to squeeze out of diaries. You know, that's really important, but it's at a premium. If you don't have that white space, where does your time for creativity actually come from? And I think, put simply, people realize that innovation is needed, but what innovation and how are we going to innovate are the questions that haven't quite been answered there. So those are my kind of points of view as an outsider on some of these challenges. And I think they're difficult to mitigate on their own. But the problem with these is that they're quite self-reinforcing and cumulative. 
and many of them are tied up in what we perceive to be quite immovable bureaucratic structures. Um, and I think when we're faced with them, it's quite easy to descend into frustration um, and cynicism. But throughout history, and particularly kind of in the last three or four years in the army, um, a variety of means have emerged um, that have sought to, I think, ease or at least find ways of working around some of these unwieldy structures. And I think while the army is certainly complex, hierarchical and bureaucratic, it's not a machine that's made up of, of human parts. One officer writing 100 years ago said that an army like any other human society is an organism whose well-being depends on the interplay of human relationships. And I think that we can perhaps push this forward or further even to time with the theme of my talk that actually the army's ability to innovate depends to a significant extent on the interplay and relationships between individuals. And I think that if you take nothing else away from this talk, is that innovation is very much dependent and reliant on people and the relationships between them. So that's where I'm going to kind of lead into my leadership constellation. Again, it's a, I'm road testing it, so I welcome any comments or critique that you might have afterwards. Um, as I said, innovation and change can only really occur in an organisation that is rich in relationships and connections, like the Army is. And how these innovations are generated, identified, how they're diffused across the organisation is very much dependent on the size, the extent and, and the degree of coupling involved in those relationships. So what I've done here is um, kind of drawn on a number of trends that have come out from imperial history, but also um, stuff relating to network theory as well, to um, put forward what I've called my leadership constellation. I know, it seems incredibly simplistic for what is an incredibly complex project or process, um, but stick with me on this one. So to me, this is made up of three elements, as you can see on the screen, expertise, brokerage, and authority. Now, this can apply to specific individuals. It can apply to skills or values or to behaviours. So that's where I think some of the flexibility uh, comes in here. So for example, you could have an individual who's got a really great idea. You then have a broker figure who recognises, supports that, acts as a kind of ally. And then you have your authority figure who has the um, position, again, the authority to decide whether that gets taken forward or not. To think about it kind of more generally, you might have a particular expertise, not just necessarily a single idea, a forum or a medium acting as that kind of broker function, and again, the authority who might have the budget in order to be able to um, champion that. So again, it kind of works, um, and I think it's an interesting way of looking at it for kind of th three reasons, effectively. First is it highlights the interdependence of people and values to the innovation process. And I fervently believe that innovation should be conceived of as a whole of organization um, process. And this requires the deep and truly meaningful engagement of, of the whole organization. Secondly, um, it reflects the need, I think, to almost kind of leapfrog elements of the chain of command. And this increases the rapidity with which ideas can cross and go up and down the organization. Now, I know he's kind of fallen a little bit out of favor, um, but Elon Musk in 2017, say the CEO of Tesla, um, highlighted the importance of this kind of leapfrogging process to innovation. So he wrote in an email to, to his Tesla employees, and I'm quoting here, instead of a problem getting solved quickly, where a person in one department talks to a person in another department, people are forced to talk to their manager, who talks to their manager, who talks to the manager of the other department, who then talks to someone on his team. And then the information has to flow back um, up the other way again. And he says this is incredibly dumb. And he advocated that anyone can and should email or talk to anyone else according to what they think is the fastest way to solve a problem for the benefit of the whole company. So, in short, put simply even, communication that's forced to go through the proper channels, as it were, is a surefire way of killing great ideas. And as I'll highlight in my case studies, the army is not 
averse to leapfrogging or circumventing the chain of command where necessary. In fact, it has a long historical tradition of doing that. And finally, um, related to that point, is that this idea of a constellation um, only really works if it's supported by an organisational culture. So we think about the Army's organisational culture, we probably all have different perspectives on what that means, but for me, kind of at the heart of it are ideas around agility and pragmatism, and these are quite vital for this to function. And I think we need to see innovation and culture as kind of symbiotic, that this constellation approach kind of underpins a culture of innovation, but is in turn reliant on that culture of innovation um, in order to succeed. So to kind of move on to how this might work in practice, um, as I said at the beginning, three case studies starting with um, my special research interest, the Army of the First World War. Um, I think it's appropriate to talk about this because you know, we have just come out of the end of the First World War centenary um, and because um, I think it's uh, an appropriate case study to look at. Um, the previous CDS, Stuart Peach, when he was talking in 2017, quite understandably referred to innovation in the First World War. And he, he was saying how struck he was by how much innovation there was 100 years ago. It was very much about innovation on the battlefield, and it achieved a remarkable effect. And I think we're no doubt familiar with the kind of big ticket innovations that come out of the First World War. So you have the aeroplane with the interrupter gear, allowing machine guns to fire through propellers. We have the invention of the tank. And we also have significant advances in medicine, notably plastic surgery. So we're all familiar with those. But perhaps less familiar are those innovations that are associated with transport and logistics, with surveying techniques, with personnel management. We're all probably aware of the context, at least I hope, of, of the British Army in the First World War. It's an army fighting total war. It's an army that has a very clear context. It has to break the stalemate on the Western Front. It's aware of who its enemy is, which is a very clear um, and present enemy in the German army. So in war, in total war, innovation is much easier, right? It's not subject to the same red tape or bureaucracy that we might associate with the peacetime forces. But what remains here are two complicated factors, and that's people and culture which both have the ability to enable and empower innovation, but also impede and hinder it in equal measure. So how does my kind of wacky idea about this constellation actually play out in practice? So I want to take artillery survey um, as my first example. This is a, a lot of change in the First World War with the development of flash spotting. You can see the picture on my left there. Um, this is about detecting the position of enemy guns through the, the flashes or through muzzle flashes. And second is sound ranging, again uh, to my immediate left there. This is the detection or detecting the location of a hostile battery from the sound um, of its guns. And this latter um, survey technique was referred to by one historian as the Manhattan Project of the First World War because of the sheer number of scientists and engineers who are kind of collaborating and co-creating this technology with the army. So the idea for these techniques uh, came from two civilian scientists, uh, Henry Hemming and Lawrence Bragg. This is Lawrence Bragg on screen here. Um, they were from Canada and Australia respectively. They were in their early 20s. And on the outbreak of war, they volunteered um, and they were commissioned into frontline infantry regiments. So their ideas, which they were developing on the front line, um, were picked up by two regular Royal Engineers colonels who worked at general headquarters, so army headquarters on the Western Front. They recognized these, backed their ideas, attempted to sell these ideas to um, senior commanders, authority figures at general headquarters. And through the endorsement of brokers and these authority figures, these ideas started to take root. So Hemming and Bragg are moved from their frontline positions and become advisors at army headquarters. They're not necessarily promoted, but it's that recognition that their expertise has value and needs to be held at a higher level. 
And what they do in their advising at Army headquarters is that they're overseeing the creation of flash spotting and sound ranging units across the Army on the Western Front. And experimentation is constantly encouraged. So Bragg kind of writes home to his father um, saying how we gave each of these sections a mechanic, we gave them some tools, we gave them a small lathe and just encouraged them to try out gadgets on the spot. And then every two months they arranged a meeting of these various sections where they kind of demonstrated and tested out uh, these new ways of working. And these effects are not just limited to the Western Front. Remember the British Army in the First World War is serving in about five or six different operational theatres. So you start seeing these units springing up in Palestine, in Italy, um, and in Salonika, so Macedonia, effectively. And one of those broker figures, one of these royal uh, engineer colonels, writes after the war saying that survey units are actually a very small part of the army as an organisation, but their effect on operations is great and out of all proportion to the numbers involved. So we are seeing here the kind of development of what we consider now to be a bit of a force multiplier. Yet this isn't without problems. This isn't just a very kind of simple, linear um, approach uh, to solving problems. Scepticism, not invented here syndrome. I'm sure we've probably all come across that. Represent two of the key challenges to this being successful. So senior leaders, our authority figures, were initially quite apathetic about this, that they required quite a lot of convincing by those Royal Engineers colonels as to why they should change how they're doing things. And even after these sections and units are embedded, you still get pockets of resistance. So Henry Hemming, who um, is unfortunately not on screen, recounted how he had a conversation with a brigadier in the Royal Artillery who had remarked, you damn surveyors with your coordinates and angles and all the rest, you're taking all of the fun out of war. Because in my day, we galloped into action and got the first round off in 30 seconds. And Hemming's writing in, in his diary at the time, he says, you know, he bit his tongue, but recalled how he'd been tempted to reply, yes, sir, and you hit nothing with it except possibly the backs of your own infantry. So you've got a kind of perhaps generational clash going on there. But these new scientific ways of working um, were attractive to the army, but they were not always easily um, accepted by them. Now, again, perhaps I've just played into the, one of those tropes that I highlighted at the beginning, that it's civilian scientists coming to the rescue of a conservative army. But that's absolutely not the case. The army in this period is very much focused on ideas of initiative, devolved command, trusting in one's subordinates, you know, things we might associate now with, with mission command. And there are plenty of examples of that kind of internal creativity and innovation. One kind of colonel is writing in about 1910 that the British officer in particular should not be cramped by systems to the detriment of the free exercise of his inborn individuality. So although we kind of abhor elements of doing it for oneself, being an individual, you know, that was really, really key, particularly to, to the officer corps um, in this particular time frame. Now, individuality is a bit of a double-edged sword, really, isn't it? But it was a necessary component of the Army's culture um, of innovation, its cultural inclination towards taking risk. Now, JFC Fuller is, is probably a name familiar to, to many of you. Um, he's best known, obviously, for his interwar writings on manoeuvre warfare, you know, as being kind of almost one of the fathers of, of the development of the tank. In 1914, that fame seemed quite a long way off for JFC Fuller. In 1914, he's a 36-year-old captain. He's thinking that his career isn't necessarily um, going the way he wanted it to. But he's very much a kind of disruptive thinker, a, a kind of soldier scholar, I'd suggest. In 1914, he publishes a book called Training Soldiers for War. This is privately published. Um, at that time, that was kind of encouraged that people would go and write about their profession. And in that book, he's focusing on how important it is to... Um, understand humans, understand human nature, um, and the need to kind of really dig deep and understand the psychology of leadership, what makes people tick. And Fuller had, you know, quite um, speculatively sent a copy of this book to a brigade staff officer that he knew. That brigade staff officer passed it on to the chief of staff of the British Third Army on the Western Front, 
and he had then passed that on to Lieutenant General Charles Munro, who was the general officer commanding the Third Army on the Western Front. So you can see here the different rank structure of a captain being approached by a brigadier general and then being approached by a lieutenant general. So you can see that there are a number of levels of the chain of command that have not been involved in this particular dialogue. So Charles Munro, really impressed by what Fuller had written in training soldiers for war, and he got his chief of staff, Arthur Lyndon Bell, to write to Fuller saying, I understand you wrote a very good book. Uh, Munro wants you to set up a school and we want that school to be developed along similar lines to what you've written here. So Fuller, a captain, is tasked with creating a syllabus, with delivering lectures to attendees. Why is this an innovation? Because this is one of the first formalised army schools on the Western Front, and it's very much a milestone, a template, that the other four army formations decide to embrace and use. So quite important, but perhaps more important that it's a captain who's been asked to lead on this. In 1916, Fuller reaches the lofty heights of Major. Um, he's tasked again, based on this experience, with establishing a senior officer's school, instructing colonels and brigadiers. And he's empowered by his new general officer commanding, um, Edmund Allenby, who goes on to great fame in the Palestine campaign with T. Lawrence. He's empowered by Allenby to report on the suggestions and views that are raised in this school. And Fuller himself says it's not a bad thing for the higher command to realise what the front line really thought of them. And I think in Fuller, what you see here is a very clear anti-authoritarian streak coming through that we're very familiar with in his interwar writings. And one of his commanding officers had actually called him out on this um, earlier in, in the war. And Fuller writes to his father about this encounter. So his commanding officer, perhaps as you're so full of ideas, you will let us know how this office should be run. And Fuller said he couldn't have given me a better opportunity or opening. I told him exactly what I thought of all this wicked waste of time. But unfortunately, he's too incompetent to realise his own ignorance and stupidity. So what I'm not advocating here is this is a good example of reasonable challenge, because obviously um, it's, it's not particularly constructive. Um, Fuller is well known for his abrasive personality and being someone who's difficult to get on with, and it might explain why his career doesn't perhaps get off to the start that he, he would have liked. But there's a recognition by senior leaders in particular, but also senior staff officers, that this is someone who could make a difference if that divergence, that um, disruptive thinking is harnessed in some way. And that's what you see with Munro and Allenby is using their positions to empower um, and to enable. So what do these First World War examples tell us about the innovation process, about the constellation? First, that obviously it can be centred around individuals, which is what we see here with Fuller, with Lyndon Bell, with Munro. But that's not always the case, as we'll see in, in future case studies. Secondly, I think the examples show a willingness to put rank and background to one side. So the three experts, all junior officers, one is a regular, two are temporary officers, scientists. But this isn't limited to the officer corps. There's plenty of examples of private soldiers, of junior NCOs drawing on their experience, whether that's in their civilian life or in their experiences in the front line, their expertise, and then having those ideas supported and disseminated. Now, there's always scepticism. It doesn't always go to plan, and I think there is a great degree um, of failure here. But underpinning all of this is the idea that it's the idea, not the rank, that has the value to the army in this particular conflict. And I think leaders in many ways recognise that, and they help empower those individuals, very much due to what I put forward is this idea of a, a culture of innovation, particularly in the army in the First World War. Now, what happens when we move away from a total war context? We look at something like the Cold War, for example, where militaries are on a war footing, but that war hasn't happened yet. So that's kind of what I want to focus on now, is, is the experience of Nigel Bagnall and some of his reforms, notably the publication of British Military Doctrine, BMD, but also the establishment of the Higher Command and Staff Course um, at Shrivenham, 
And there are some differences here in how the constellation functions, particularly when we look at the brokerage element of, of this particular equation. But what is consistent with the First World War case study is the context. Okay, so there's not, it's not a hot war, there's not active war fighting going on here, but the enemy was clear, the possibility of conflict was apparent, and someone like Bagnall is aware of that, and aware that perhaps the British Army at that point is not quite as fit for purpose as it could be. So Nigel Bagnall has a very esteemed career. He serves as commander of um, one corps. He's commander-in-chief of the British Army of the Rhine. He's commander of NATO's Northern Army Group, and then he ends up as, as CGS. And he provides a really vital role in the kind of doctrinal, the educational uh, renaissance of the British Army. And one of the elements he's most keen to develop, the element that he thinks is, is a little bit lacking in the army at this time, is that he wants less rigid and more manoeuvrist approaches to defence. And he wanted to ensure that that was enshrined in doctrine, but also in education. So he wants to embed this structurally. Now, Bagnall is aware of talent that exists further down the chain of command. So the individuals who I've got there at the top are very, very young-looking John Kisley. Um, to the right, Patrick Cordingly, and at the bottom, I'm sure you're all familiar with, Rupert Smith. So he's aware that there's expertise at that early and mid-career officer level, and he might use this expertise in order to perhaps explore his ideas a bit further. But what's required is that little slice in the middle, um, and that emerges as an informal group. It's originally called the Tactical Doctrine Committee, a very catchy phrase, established in 1981. It's seen referred to as the ginger group, um, and apparently this is a riff on Bagnall's hair colour, uh, a ginger, um, when he was younger. And the ginger group was unofficial. This is a circle, primarily of officers, constantly changing membership, ranging from about 12 to 30 members um, at any given time, and it's bringing in fresh ideas. And its membership is drawn from different branches of the army, different ranks, and you often have junior officers invited over senior commanders. And again, some of the three members at various points on the screen there. But what's important to note is this isn't a group of yes-men. They weren't there to give Bagnall the answer he wanted to hear. You know, a lot of the discussion was very heated. It was quite open. Efforts were made to invite critics to the circle, the group, get them to share their opinion. And even if those critics weren't converted, after the meeting, they at least left with a better understanding as to why this group had been established and why it was important. Following the various sessions, you know, reports were written up and they were pushed out to various individuals within the army. So it was attempting to not be seen as a closed shop, that it was, you know, an old boys club, as it were. And in many respects, this group is a really important function in you know, that forum to discuss the manoeuvrist approach, which I'm sure we all know and love now. Um, and that approach becomes embedded in British military doctrine in 1989, you know, one of the first formal army doctrines that's actually read by people in the army. Yet the group itself, much like our case study of surveying techniques, has its detractors. People like Field Marshal Carver, General Aitkirst at the time, are really concerned that this is leading to elitism, that it's leading to the development of factions within the army, and they kind of hark back to the cliques that exa existed in the army before the First World War. And they also were concerned about what they refer to as the unorthodox methods of appointing junior officers over senior ones to sit on this particular group. But despite its detractors, it proves really important, it proves instrumental even, in establishing something of a consensus within the British Army. Now, I, I know it'd be tempting to see this as, as a bit of an old boys club, as little more than a discussion forum where people sit around and um, chat about the Army, seeing it as a, selection, a, a selective exclusionary clique. But it's much more than that. For um, the scholar Aitan Shamir, he says it's a really powerful tool in neutralizing um, any kind of opposition within the military. And you can see that as, as a positive and a negative. For others, it's kind of one of the original think tanks, you know, an antecedent to today's DCDC based down in Shrivenham.
And the group in many ways is influential and it's powerful enough to realise institutional change. You, know, you think this is a, a group of 12 to 30 officers and they're able to kind of drive through quite a lot of change here. And it's kind of a really interesting example of quite a productive interplay between you know, top-down leadership in the form of Bagnall, bottom-up ideas and expertise, and that ginger group is that medium, that community of practice almost, in bringing that together and then disseminating out. Now, what we need to bear in mind here is this change isn't rapid. The Bagnall reforms actually take about 18 years to actually come into practice. And that's what we need to be aware of with innovation, is that it's all well and good thinking about it in terms of months rather than years, but changing organisations, creating new structures actually does take quite a lot of time. Um, and this is something that Bagnall was very aware of. Um, it's quite ironic even that the final stages of Bagnall's reforms, the Cold War, is coming to an end. Um, so the British military doctrine, as it was constituted, had some really key touchstones, but was largely kind of irrelevant to the context that the army was moving into. But what he did establish was the Higher Command and Staff College, which still runs today, um, and also a formal army doctrine. And I think we can't overlook that because historically, the army has always opted for a doctrine of no doctrine. So this was quite a big uh, cultural challenge for Bagnall to kind of push through. And I put to you that those are the two kind of legacies, really, um, of his reforms. What about Bagnall himself? You can see on screen there. You know, in many ways, he's atypical of the officer corps, but he's not a maverick. He's not trying to buck the trend in any way. As one scholar's written, you know, Bagnall had the support of his superiors who permitted him to reform doctrine, who protected him when his ideas were subject to criticism from uh, West Germany during his time as commander of the Northern Army Group. But they also promoted him to positions where he could actually make a difference. So what we see is Bagnall being empowered by his superiors while simultaneously empowering his subordinates. And via that ginger group, he's able to tap into that creativity, that divergent thinking. But how would something like that fare in the army of today? A kind of uh, being tapped up to be part of a think tank group, rather than it being necessarily an open forum. And do we see here actually a form of patronage in the 1980s, of people being opted in because of who they are? And I wonder if that undercuts some of the ideals that we aspire to, that we hold on to as a meritocracy, and whether that reinforces groupthink. Or can we see this as a positive example of patronage in the British Army, and that actually the people who are chosen to be in the ginger group are chosen to be there because of their merit, because of their creativity and intellect. So it might be something we discuss, how good is patronage for the British Army of today. So, Again, what I've shown you here, hopefully, um, is circumventing the chain of command, kind of bucking the trend, as it were, getting bright, intellectual, capable individuals um, involved in the innovation process. And again, it's ideas, not rank, that have the value. And how does this all stand up today? So what I think is different in today's army are the quite diverse attempts, both inside and outside the army, to attempt to flatten the chain of command. And there have been efforts, I think, um, to you know, attempt to engage with people at junior command um, levels, um, to connect those people with those who have the authority. Um, and they've created, I think, these kind of avenues or different pathways to encourage idea generation, to encourage innovation to happen. Now, I only want to touch on a few of these, and I'm sure there are ones that I've left out. Um, but these are just the most obvious ones, being a sort of civilian looking into the army. Now, I know that the top one isn't necessarily an army one, so it's located in Joint Force Command. But the J-Hub is a really great example of that kind of attempt to flatten about the creation of some kind of avenue there for innovation. And the J-Hub itself describes itself as a brokering service. So it instantly places itself in that middle part of the constellation. And it's acting as that intermediary between experience and expertise and authority in the form of um, commander of, of Joint Force Command.
Now, I know much is made of J-Hub's, you know, kind of federated approach. It's, it's tri-service, you've got civilians in there. They all wear kind of casual clothes and they're not based in an MOD facility. They're based in a nice kind of open plan office in London. You know, is that important to innovation or is that just something that is felt important to create an innovative culture in J-Hub? And I just wonder how vital that is. I'd also be interested to know how successful J-Hub's been in actually idea implementation, idea generation to implementation. To look at the Army, you've got the establishment of the Army Rapid Innovation and Experimental Laboratory, Aerial. Um, again, offers that similar brokerage function. You know, Major General Takel, in his talk or speech even to the Rusi Land Warfare Conference, said that Aerial was bringing new, novel and cunning approaches into the land force by nurturing the brilliant ideas that our people have. So again, the creation there of some kind of medium, some kind of brokerage facility to get good ideas to people who can make the difference. Second, you've got, well, before I get on to the experimental brigade, you've got the force development nexus. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. Um, again, this is an online forum. It very much kind of promotes itself as enabling people from industry, from different ranks of the army, from academia to access people in um, force development senior roles. And then finally, in a kind of uh, harking back to uh, the interwar years, the experimentation brigade. So having a designated brigade in order to test out um, a number of innovations. And again, Major General Tickell makes a big thing about this in his land warfare conference speech. He says it links our youngest soldiers and officers straight to his force development and capability development teams. And he sees this as generating a lot of energy um, and a lot of enthusiasm. So I think what we see here is the army leaning in quite a lot um, in order to set up a number of different avenues for innovation and idea generation. And I think senior commanders, whether successfully or not, again, a point for discussion, they've sought to make themselves available through the acceptable, and this is key, the acceptable flattening of that chain of command. What we see here also is a move from an opt -in, from a self-selective or selective approach to a more opt-in approach, which in theory gives everyone, regardless of their rank, the opportunity to have a say if they want to. But how much impact do these really have? Like how much impact do they have on your day-to-day -day lives? Do they inspire empowerment across the army? Or do they kind of reinforce what um, Tim Jones has written for Grounded Curiosity? If you haven't read the post, check it out. Um, he's recently called this innovation theater or performative innovation, where there's a strong culture of great ideas, but what's missing is the implementation of those ideas. And that actually what we're seeing here is performance rather than true innovation. And it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on whether they're just reinforcing innovation theatre than innovation itself. Now, in recent years, we've seen the establishment of kind of more external um, approaches, more informal mediums for creativity and innovation, which kind of suggests maybe that what's on offer here isn't enough or it's too hidebound by structures uh, to be of much use. But this is nothing new. We look back 100 years ago, we have the Army Review, we have the Rusi Journal, the United Services Magazine. These are all outlets, particularly for the Army, for people to write about their service, to come up with new ideas, new ways of doing things. Um, and so I think what we see with the establishment of forums such as the Wavell Room, but also Defence Entrepreneurs Forum out in the States and Australia, is kind of an evolution of those service journals or those external journals but brought into the 21st century. So both Wavell Room and DEF provide another means through which authority figures can access the expertise and ideas of people lower down the organisation. And I think both of these at their heart are designed to be complementary, they're designed to be kind of honest brokers rather than adversarial to what the army is doing as an institution. So if we look at Wavell Room uh, first, you know, this is, sits outside the army ostensibly, established by two officers on the intermediate command and staff course at Shrivenham. And, you know, this blog has grown exponentially, particularly in the last year. 
It's host posts from civilians, from NCOs, from private soldiers, from officers. Um, and it's also accessed by those who are in positions of authority. So on my left here, you've got Rupert Jones posting about the communications review. You also have a tweet in the middle from Kev Copsey, so um, head of Future Force Development. He's remarking on Twitter you know, that many of these articles, comments and discussions actually feed into force development work. And we find experiences if we look at our neighbours across the pond. Now, I don't know how many of you read War on the Rocks or are aware of it, but there was this quite um, famous exchange between Colonel Ned Stark, clearly a big Game of Thrones fan, um, writing about some of the challenges in the US Air Force. And the Chief of Staff of the US Air Force, General Goldfein, writes back to him via this forum. And he actually offers Colonel Ned Stark, uh, Ned Stark a job on his team, looking into some of the challenges that the original writer raised. And Goldfein kind of ends his post saying, you know, if you don't want this job, if it doesn't work for you, please just keep writing. Your chief is reading and listening. So again, a very kind of tangible example there of the importance of these kind of external um, avenues uh, for creativity. Now, if we look at DEF, Defence Entrepreneurs Forum, this offers something kind of subtly different. There's a variety of chapters around the world, but DEF is described by its creators who, when this was established a number of years ago, were at kind of lieutenant and captain level. Um, they describe it as a peripheral network, that it's about, and I quote, equipping entrepreneurial young leaders to be effective change makers in their formal organization. Now, these young leaders have different ranks. They come from different branches and services, but when they're at the Defence Entrepreneurs Forum event, they have the same platform, the same audience and the same mic time as people who might be two star or three stars. So again, there's a kind of more equitable approach, I think, here. So DEF itself acts as that brokerage function in that constellation. It puts those with expertise in front of those who have the authority to decide whether something gets funded or not. And that kind of idea of a constellation sits very much at the centre of Deaf Australia's kind of intent, where they say they bring serving personnel from all rank levels um, into contact with senior decision makers. So although Deaf sits outside of the military organisation, it has buy-in from those senior individuals about whether pitches, like you can see the one on my far left there, whether they get seed corn funding in order to start up and pilot. And you have a range of different pitches from kind of use of drones in logistics functions to rolling out yoga across the whole of the Australian Defence Force, things like that that are given the same um, time and space in front of senior decision makers. What's interesting to me is that DEF has been incredibly successful in America and Australia, yet it's seemingly in abeyance here in the United Kingdom. And I have no idea why that is. It might be because the workload is quite substantial. But I'd welcome perhaps your thoughts or your suggestions as to why this kind of approach hasn't necessarily taken on over here. So I want to kind of end this case study by saying, you know, that the creation of avenues for kind of innovation and creativity are nothing new. But perhaps more importantly, they're nothing to be feared either. And I think because many of these informal avenues are kind of accessed by people in authority figures, it kind of legitimizes them. But I think when we look at stuff like the Wavel Room, what we see is many posts written from serving personnel under pseudonyms or using initials or using first name only, which suggests that there's still a lingering fear of retribution, that someone might not agree with what you're saying and that someone might have an impact on your career later. And I think, you know, we should be embracing you know, these forums for creativity and divergent thinking because they're just another way of getting good ideas up to the people who can make a decision on them. But have these two forums struck that balance between idea generation and implementation? Have they found a way of mitigating that innovation theatre? Again, something to discuss. So I'm going to wrap up now so we can really get into the fun stuff of the day, the Q&A. Um, I want to start with, I, this is Nick Carter when he's CGS, his leadership intent. Um, it might have changed, now we, we have a new CGS. 
But his intent there speaks to the importance of empowering and enabling, remarking how leadership must empower their subordinates routinely because this will give them the confidence to act boldly and independently on the battlefield. We must strive to maximise the potential of all our soldiers and use their talent to help us win. This means leaders must tolerate risk and accept honest mistakes. So this is the aspiration, the intent. How does that match up? to the reality of command and leadership in the army. Words like empowerment and risk, you know, are used a lot in defense, and I think in many respects we run the risk of them losing their power and becoming little more than buzzwords. Um, Richard Niji did a really great interview for the Army Leader blog, and he remarked on empowerment and says that actually it's a way of adding value to what you do, trusting your subordinates and giving them the space to do their job, but also to kind of think outside the box, are really, really key. And I wonder, is empowerment something that can only be dispensed at higher levels of command? You know, how easy, how willing are you to empower at your junior levels um, of command and leadership? And what about risk? Because we see with that intent that leaders have to tolerate risk rather than necessarily take it. And how does that impact on empowerment? Now, in many ways, I don't think we can divorce context from you know, that kind of muddy link between aspiration and reality, particularly where innovation is concerned. Now, if we look back to the case studies on the First World War and the Cold War, the army has a clear purpose, has a clear aim, and it has quite an apparent enemy to fight. Now, of course, we're looking back 100 years, 30 years from the time, and hindsight's a really great thing because you know, that's quite obvious. But things might not necessarily have seemed that clear at the time. But I think it does kind of give us a bit of a pause for thought. Is the crisis point, which is seemingly so evident in our First World War and Cold War case studies, is that crisis point missing for armed forces in the contemporary environment? And if it is, what does that mean for innovation, that drive for innovation? And I think history kind of gives us some really great examples. If we think about the army before the First World War. It's fighting highly kinetic colonial insurgencies. It's a small professional force. The First World War comes along. It's fighting mass continental warfare. It's having to rapidly expand from seven divisions to over 60 divisions. In the interwar years, so in the years following the First World War, the army goes back to highly kinetic colonial insurgency, is castigated for its poor training, its poor doctrine, for not embracing technology when we view the army through the lens of the failures at Dunkirk and Norway. But what it's doing is it's what it's been trained to do, is that the First World War is seen as a bit of an aberration, a bit of a blip. It's just going back to what it's used to doing. And I wonder whether we're kind of in that twilight zone, that interwar twilight zone now, where we have an idea that resurgent Russia might be the next enemy. But what do we do to combat that? Where, where do you focus your effort, as it were, in terms of innovation? And I think the unpredictable nature of innovation compounds this further. So to come kind of full circle back to our organisational challenges. Because in many ways you can't force an organisation to innovate. You can't inject it into an organisation. Because in many ways innovation is a practice and it's a skill set. And if you want people to generate ideas, to come up with new ways of thinking, for them to then be implemented, there needs to be the space, the time, and the resources to actually enable that. And I think in many ways, that's kind of where leadership comes in. That sometimes your value, as Richard Nugy suggested, is added by creating that space. And I think perhaps we, I say we, you, perhaps you all aspire to be innovative leaders. But actually, being a leader of innovation is just, if not more, valuable. And I think the ability to listen, to resource where possible, and to support are absolutely fundamental. And this, again, this applies at all levels of command. It's not just limited to your three-star level. It's to your kind of junior NCOs, your warrant officers, your junior officers as well. And in short, we can't see innovation as just being purview of the experimentation brigade. Actually, this is something that the whole of defence needs to get behind. Now, I think we've seen a willingness by senior leaders, particularly 
uh, to provide those avenues for innovation. Whether that's resolved that problem of innovation theatre is very much um, a discussion and a paper for another time. But what I think is clear, and again, this is something that, that Niji really kind of drove home in his interview, is that by listening and encouraging subordinates, um, encouraging dissenters, promoting self-reliance, and actually, where necessary, subverting that chain of command, I think leaders have and leaders will continue to play a really vital role in developing, but also sustaining um, the culture of innovation, which is absolutely fundamental for those ideas to be implemented and diffused um, across the army. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Um, very much looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thank you.